Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Laura Fluke, who's one of our surgical oncology fellows at uh, St. John's Providence. And so her mission is kind of give you a little bit of ups and downs of surgery. So thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Esner. And good morning to everyone in the audience and online listening to us. I hear we're being broadcast internationally, so this will be my first international broadcast. I'm very excited. <laughs> So I'll be talking to you this morning about what you need to know about surgery and melanoma. So we treat melanoma in a number of ways. Surgery is a way that we treat the lesion on the skin. And sometimes we need to evaluate the lymph nodes. There are uh, less commonly times when we operate on other areas of the body. Say if the melanoma has gone to the lung or the liver, we can remove those areas as well. Now, there are some of us in the room that treat melanoma with systemic therapies through an IV. Are there any medical oncologists in the room? Oh yes, I thought there was one. Good, excellent, yes. So medical oncologists are the people that you'll see when you need systemic therapy. And less commonly, we treat melanoma with radiation. Now, are there any radiation oncologists in the room? Yeah, I didn't think so because that's how uncommon it's required. So <laughs> why is the incision so long? We get this question frequently. So those of you that have had melanoma, does, does anyone have a you know, fair size incision? We're not having a competition this morning. You don't have to show me, right? But so you may have returned to your doctor's office and thought, man, was that necessary? Well, the, the length of the incision is really determined by the size of the pigmented lesion, right? The mole and the depth of it. Okay, so who, any mathematicians in the room? I, I know I'm asking a lot about people's jobs today, but no mathematicians? Well, I'm gonna need you guys to math with me for a minute, but I, I think we can do it, they're simple numbers. So let's say, uh, I, I have our um, recommended surgical margins up here. So these are again, based on tumor thickness or the depth in the skin. And so if a tumor, like right here, if it's one millimeter thick, we recommend a one to two centimeter margin. Here, maybe we'll do this. I think this math will be easier. We're gonna go with the easy math because there are no mathematicians. So if it's less than a millimeter, we would take a one centimeter margin. So say this mole, and for those of you that maybe don't use centimeters all the time, because we live in America, <laughs> 2.5 centimeters is an inch, okay? But for, for math's sake, and in medicine, we use centimeters. So if you have a mole that's one centimeter in size, okay, and it was less than a millimeter thick, then we would want one centimeter on either side of it, of a gross margin, right? And gross not being like, ew, right? But, but normal, of normal appearing skin around it. Okay, so we, we mark out that circle, and so if I have a, a mole that's one centimeter and I need one centimeter on either side, what would that be? Three, thank you. Uh, applause for the lady. She might be a mathematician. Okay, good. So, so if it's three centimeters high, then we have to multiply that by three centimeters and that will give you the length, okay? And that's because we can't close a circle in a line. When we close the circle in a line, you get these things called dog ears, and that's when the skin's raised up at the edges, and that skin will catch on things. People, people don't like that because it'll catch on clothing, right? So we want a nice, smooth surface on the skin. So that will, so we turn that circle into an ellipse. So the, the height of the ellipse determines the length. So like we mathed, right? So a three centimeter high circle would make, oh, no a nine centimeter high or a nine centimeter long lips. So that's how you get these longer scars without dog ears. Thank you for your participation. That was excellent. Okay, 
So uh, as I kind of described in the last slide, that's what an area of excision would look like, right? This eye shape, ellipse, football, what, you know, depending on if you're a sports fan or whatever, whatever shape it is you want. Um, Mohs surgery is another way that sometimes dermatologists uh, manage skin cancer. Okay. I'm sure if, if you've had any other skin cancers, maybe a basal cell or a squamous cell, you've had or heard of Mohs surgery. So Mohs surgery is when a dermatologist, and you know, I'm making this simple, right? I, I don't do this. But so dermatologists that are specialized in Mohs surgery will take layer by layer of skin and look at it under a microscope. And they can do this by freezing that tissue, putting it on a microscope and checking the margins, okay? So they're looking to see if there are any cancer cells that are at the surrounding tissue. And if there are, they go back and they take another layer and look at, look at that tissue. So this is very commonly performed for basal cell and squamous cell cancers, but is more difficult for melanoma because of the way those cells look under the microscope. So after surgery, we, so we operate on someone, we send them home. And I always tell my patients, Hey, there are some things I want you to look for. Has, so those of you that have had surgery, do you remember any of the things that we told you to look for after surgery, like from your incision, things we'd want to know about, right? Redness around the incision, pus drainage from the incision, fevers, none of those things are normal, right? And we want to know about it because those are things that can be signs of a problem after surgery or a complication, okay? So surgical site infections uh, can occur after surgery and these normally present within 30 days. The incision will appear red, the skin around it may be thickened or hot. Sometimes the patient can experience fevers or chills. If any of those things are going on after surgery, we wanna know about it. Sometimes that is treated with antibiotics or we may have to remove the sutures and drain the infection. So uh, this is maybe one of the more common things we see, we see although it's still, still very uncommon. So seromas. A seroma is a collection of fluid under the skin. When we remove a portion of skin and that the, the fat under the skin, uh, we close that space, right? We close the skin and close that space and your body wants to fill that space with fluid. That's called a seroma. This is benign fluid, right? It's not infection, okay? And it won't hurt you. The body will reabsorb it over time. This is commonly seen after we remove lymph nodes from an area, okay? So that can, it can present as a uh, like benign swelling, right? Sometimes it can be tender. And if it's tender and you let us know, we can bring you into clinic and sometimes we'll stick a needle in it and drain it. That's called aspiration. And lymphedema. Lymphedema uh, occurs when we operate on lymph nodes. Historically, this was seen more commonly. Because back, I don't know, 30 years ago, Dr. Esner, 30, 20, he, he, not so long ago, he, he would know better than I would. But so 20, 30 years ago, when people were removing all of the lymph nodes from an area to check to see if there's melanoma in those lymph nodes, people were, would more commonly experience swelling of that extremity, right? The, the reason we check lymph nodes is to see if the cancer has spread to those, right? But St. John's and Dr. Dr. Esner participated in this huge worldwide study. When we looked at where melanoma drains so that we could check only a few of those lymph nodes so that we no longer had to take all of the lymph nodes out because lymphedema can be debilitating for people. This can result in significant swelling of the arm or the leg that can result in loss of function or range of motion. So now we usually perform something called a sentinel lymph node biopsy, okay, where we use radioactive material all right, we have you go to a special place where radiation doctors inject right around the melanoma, the skin lesion, and that will travel through the lymphatic system to the lymph nodes that if 
the cancer has spread, it would go to those lymph nodes first. Another question that patients ask me a lot is, if we find lymph nodes with the radiation, does that mean there's cancer in the nodes? And no, no, that just means that if your cancer is going to a lymph node, that, the, that node or a couple of nodes are the nodes that it would go to. So those are the nodes that we want to test. So we use the radioactive material and blue dye to find those lymph nodes. Leading. Okay. So raise the hands. Anybody seen Gray's Anatomy? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so bleeding after surgery is probably not what you'll see on TV. Uh, the most common, although still uncommon, but the most common we'll see, way we'll see bleeding after surgery is something called a hematoma. So that's when we remove the, the skin and that fat and that space that I was talking about earlier, where sometimes you can get a stroma. If blood were to go into that space, if you were to bleed into that space, then it will fill with blood. And eventually, since the skin is closed, uh, the, the pressure increases so much that the bleeding kind of stops. And then that blood co coagulates or turns into a clot right under the skin. And that's a hematoma. It can present with significant bruising, even like a swelling or mass. It can be quite tender. Sometimes there will even be blood coming from the incision. So if, if those things happen, that, that would be something we'd want to know about. Sometimes we can drain that by putting a needle in it. Sometimes we just observe it, right? If it's not real symptomatic for the patient. And other times we have to take the patient maybe to the procedure room or to the operating room to, to take that blood clot out and reclose the incision. There are certain things that put patients at risk for bleeding after surgery. And those things are a medical history of a bleeding disorder or certain medications. Um, the medications that we most, the you know, most frequent offenders are going to be those that affect your platelets. So things like aspirin or Plavix, if anyone's heard of those, other uh, medications that that thin the blood. So sometimes uh, heart disorders or a history of strokes, people will be on those kind of medications. So we usually have people hold those medications before and after surgery for a while. And then grafts. Does, you don't have to raise your hand, but does anyone in here have or know someone that had to have a graft? Okay. So I, I, you can, I guess, maybe not listen to that. You probably know everything because man, we have, we our patients with grafts have a lot of questions and there's usually a lot of bath and back and forth and explanation. You could probably explain it to everyone, but, but I'll do it this time. Um, so uh, we use a graft when we can't make that beautiful, albeit long incision. Okay, when we can't close the skin because the skin is maybe on the scalp or around the ankle or on the foot, right? The, the skin there is just not as pliable or flexible as it is on the arm or the leg or on the trunk. So when we can't get the skin to close, we need to use a graft. Sometimes I guess we, we can rotate other skin in there, but for all intents and purposes right here, it's, we, we need to use a graft. So there are ways that we take skin from other areas. You'll see this picture over here. And this is from a site where we would take a split thickness skin graft. That means we just shave the top layers of cells. Uh, they're the top layer of skin. Off an area, we usually use the thigh or the abdomen. And then we, we put that skin on the ankle, as you can see up there. That the, this depiction is showing where we have meshed that skin. And sometimes we have to do that to get it to stretch big enough to cover the whole area. And whenever we do grafts, we want to protect them because we've now made an extra wound on this patient that has to heal it. So we protect grafts with a bolster. That's what's shown here, this yellow gauze that's sutured to the skin, so tied to the skin, and then we keep it in place. So this bolster protects that skin graft because the, the worst thing that could happen to a skin graft is if it, it the shearing forces could just shear it off, right? So we protect the graft with the bolster. We usually ask patients to keep that clean and dry. So if it's on the scalp, wear a shower cap. They're very fashionable. We've just heard about hats. Shower caps also very fashionable. Uh, or if it's on the ankle, you can uh, you can even get like 
plastic sacks on Amazon so that you could keep those clean and dry and still shower. Um, the other type of skin graft is a full thickness skin graft. And so when we do that, we take skin, like all the layers of skin from another area and put it uh, over the wound. And those areas we're usually able to close in a thin incision. So, you know, if you have, if we've shaved the top layers of cells off, this is what it would look like. If it's the full thickness skin graft, you would have a longer incision. So these, these are pictures. Um, and I don't know what you guys think about them, but I think they look great. <laughs> These are very healthy, uh, nice appearing skin grafts. Okay. So uh, on your right, there's a full thickness skin graft. Um, as you can tell that it's healing very well. And on the left here is a split thickness skin graft where we've actually meshed it and tied it and, and sutured it to the skin. So thank you for joining me today. Um, this is a picture of Melody. So as a fellow, I have the opportunity to work with multiple different surgical oncologists at St. John's Cancer Institute. I have been with Dr. Esner since August and on November 1st, I'll rotate away. Now he always has fellows working with him because he's an, ex an exceptional surgeon and he needs to pass on his knowledge and skills to the next generation. But Melody is his right-hand woman, and she's with him all the time. So I just thought you should see her face in case you are to see him in clinic. All right, I'll take questions at the end. Yes, thank you. Thank you.